Director of Generations Health Education, a Generational Awareness Advocate, Gerontology Instructor at Johns Hopkins University, author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One. Jennifer Lanny James, how you doing today? Good, Lanny. Thanks so much for having me on. Good to have you on. This is a touchy subject. I'm talking about dementia, Alzheimer's. I've never known anybody personally that had it. I had a good friend whose father passed away, Jennifer, and to the best of my knowledge, for the last 10 year, years of his life, he spent some time, spent those years in a nursing home over here, didn't know anybody, yeah. unable to, uh, to respond, and it, it's so sad to me, and he's a big old gentle guy. I'm from Michigan. And his son was the first Southern friend I ever had. And they treated me so nice, had me over for Christmas. I was 18 years old at the time. But it, it touched me when, when all of this happened to him. Jennifer, so many people so are, many. Dealing, are dealing with this problem. And it hurts them so much. Well, with your friend's dad, there's about 5 million Americans actually dealing with Alzheimer's disease. And there's even more people having the diagnosis of another type of dementia because there's many types of dementia. So I'm so sorry about your, your friend's dad, but unfortunately there's so many families going through that right now. So let me, the, the, let me. Goal that my, my, you know, the goal is for, for folks like me, we, we're trying to help families and help caregivers do the best they can to help their loved ones. Let me read this. This is off your release here. Dementia is a decline or loss of reasoning memory and other mental abilities. This decline eventually impairs the ability to carry out everyday activities such as driving, household chores, and even personal care such as bathing, dressing, and feeding. Here's what I want to ask you and something I've been puzzled about. I read a lot. I, you know, I watch a lot of stuff and I've, I've tried to keep up with some of this stuff, but I'm not sure I've ever got a grasp of what's the delineation between dementia and Alzheimer's. Is there any, Jennifer? And if so, what is it? Absolutely. And that's a great question, a really common question. And unless you work in this field, uh, usually people don't know. So dementia is really symptoms. It's simply, it's, like you said, you just shared some of the symptoms, you know, memory loss, especially short term. Uh, for some people, it starts out by getting lost in familiar places, maybe getting lost in your own neighborhood, uh, maybe forgetting the year that it is or who the president is. So dementia is really simply symptoms. And when someone's got symptoms like that, what we want for them to do is get to their doctor and find out what's causing the symptoms. And the cause, sometimes, about, about 65, 70% of the time, if someone has those symptoms, and there's not a reversible cause for them, it's Alzheimer's disease. So to, to give you an example, when I say the term pasta, the first thing that everybody thinks of, what, you know, what kind of pasta do you think of most? Spaghetti. Most people say, what did you say? Spaghetti. Exactly, exactly. So if you say spaghetti, so Alzheimer's is, I liken Alzheimer's is like the spaghetti to pasta. It's the one that everybody remembers. It's the one everybody thinks of. But there's actually other diseases that cause dementia symptoms also. Let me ask you this. And I, Jennifer, I get so mad at myself. Now, I just turned, me and my twin sister turned 76, April 24th. Now, let me ask you this. I'll walk from one room to another sometimes. <laughs> Forget what I did it for. Every other day, I seem to leave my cell phone or something, briefcase or something, drives me up the wall. Have I got dementia? Am I borderline or how much of this is normal? <laughs> I really hope you're not worried about that. And I really hope that your listeners don't worry about those types of things because it's very normal. We all do those things at every age. But, you know, you just said that you turned 76. Um, as we get older, we're going to do those things a little bit more. We call that tip of the tongue moment or benign senescence. So these are harmless and it's it's nothing to worry about, but we all do it. And again, as we get older, we do a little bit of a little bit more of that type of thing. One of the ways we can combat that is 
you know, if you always put your phone, like try to have a place that you put your phone in your house, uh, the same place. Or if you go to the grocery store, make a list. You know, those are the small things you can do to kind of combat that normal aging stuff. You know, my twin sister, and this isn't fair, Jennifer, because she got the looks and the brains. But she came to see me four or five years ago, and, and she knows how I lose everything. Look, I got a good mind. Even at my age, it's still quick. I jump around. That maybe one reason I have so much tr trouble remembering things. But she got me a little old plastic box container tray, and she put a sign up there that said, Everything goes here. That's a great. See, that's great. She knows you. you. She knows that you lose things, and and you know to have a system like that. How, and that's what I recommend to folks. You know, when they start worrying about those normal age-related changes, do something like that. It sounds like your sister's on the right track. Well, she is so organized. It's painful. That's wonderful. But but let me ask you this, Jennifer. With this dementia thing, is it typically? In the 60s, 70s, can it happen in the 40s? And if it happens early, like in the 40s and the 50s, is it usually progressive and becomes much worse over time? When does the onslaught, onslaught happen, and, and how does it happen to most people? And, yeah. and is, there a, is there a recurring pattern or, or a frequency among other people? Okay, great question. So with, with dementia symptoms, so again, like I said, Alzheimer's disease is the, pro is the main dementia, but about 30 to 35% of the time, it's, there's other dementias. And some of those, for example, frontotemporal dementia, that most commonly, uh, if somebody's gonna have that, it's in the 50s or the 60s, we start to see symptoms, for example. But Alzheimer's disease, which is your most common one, most people, if they're going to have it, their symptoms, are they're starting later, 70s, 80s, 90s. And so, Obviously, with, with many of the dementias, your risk factor does go up with age. I can tell you the top four risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are getting older, having a first-degree relative, mom, dad, brother, sister, who's had Alzheimer's, having had a major head trauma. And I know you're, you're a sports guy. You're, you're probably real familiar with, with all of the stuff with uh, you know, folks in boxing and football, there's a lot of talk right now about head trauma. Concussion. And then the last one being um, heart disease. Heart disease is strongly linked. None of those things mean, and even if you have all of those things, those four markers, doesn't mean you're going to have Alzheimer's, but those are just the ones that are most highly linked with having it. You know, you read things now. And you see things advertised on television. I don't know how legit they are, Jennifer. But has there been progress made? I know you can't cure Alzheimer's, but are there medications or treatments that they can do that can slow down the progression uh, markedly over time, uh, minimally over time? What do you see about that, and what do you see in the future? There's meds. There's definitely there's there's some meds out there that help with the symptoms. They don't slow down the disease. But if someone you love is, is having some of these symptoms, the best thing to do, get them to the doctor and get a qualified physician to diagnose them. Because by the way, it is possible you can have dementia symptoms and it could be something that we could treat, especially for, for older adults. It could be a B12 deficiency, it could be depression, uh, there could be an infection of some kind. But if it actually is Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, there are a couple of different types of drugs that can be utilized. But it's very, very important to know that they don't slow down the disease. They help with symptoms. They, For a lot of people, they make the symptoms a little bit less pronounced. But they, unfortunately, sadly, they don't slow down the progress of the disease. Jennifer, I've heard so many allude to the fact that there seems to be an epidemic of Alzheimer's. I have a little different take on this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know because of the times we live in if there's environmental factors, but, but let me say this. Forty years ago or whatever, the average lifespan was maybe 62, 63 years old. Mm -hmm. People now are living in their 80s and 90s. And it stands to reason to me, Jennifer, that that gives the brain more time to deteriorate, that we're experiencing things now because of longevity 
which end up being Alzheimer's simply from the fact that people are living so long. And wouldn't that be a big factor? Lanny, that, you make a good point because, yes, people are living longer, and so, but, but know that just because you're getting older does not mean you will have a form of irreversible dementia. Dementia is never part of the normal aging process. Many, many, many older adults live, you know, to their 90s. You know, we just had the oldest person pass away, I think, at 117. That's right. Um, but, but I think you're right. You're on to something, certainly, with people are living longer, and so we're seeing these diseases that we've never seen before. We've gotten good at putting cancer into remission and curing cancer and keeping people alive with, you know, things that maybe they would die from previously, like heart disease. So I think you're right on with that point. Folks, I know a lot of you may not even want to talk about this, but Jennifer is an expert. If you got any questions or comments, give me a call at 324-1500. I know this is a subject, and it's a painful one in, in many instances, that touches so many people. We'll take a break. We'll be back with Jennifer Fitzpatrick right after this. Hi again, everybody. We're talking about a painful subject, touchy subject, and touches so many people's lives. It's called dementia or Alzheimer's. Got an expert on by the name of Jennifer Fitzpatrick. And I know some of you may have some questions. And if you want to ask her something, uh, feel free to give us a call. We got a lady on line two named Mary. Mary, how you doing today? I'm doing just fine, Lanny. How are you? I'm fine. What's your question or comment today about this subject? <laughs> Lanny, my brilliant husband, who was high school principal, died three months ago of Lewy body dementia. I wonder if, if your guest could speak to that. Uh, particular kind of dementia. Jennifer, I didn't understand what she called it. Uh, what was Lewy, it? Ex Lewy body dementia. Yeah. Yeah. Explain Lewy it. Lewy body dementia. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Bless your heart, Mary. Thanks for calling. Mary, thanks for calling. I'm so sorry about your husband. The Lewy body dementia is actually, according to the Lewy body dementia association, is considered to be the second most common form of irreversible dementia. And it's a little bit different from Alzheimer's. Uh, most of the time, people with Lewy body dementia, they have issues that are, are more, uh, they have, in addition to the memory, they have Parkinsonian symptoms along with it. So they have that shakiness. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, with, any, with many dementias, there's hallucinations and delusions. They're very pronounced with Lewy body dementia. And one of the, one of the, the big problems for caregivers like Mary is that, a lot of times the person with Lewy body dementia has very vivid dreams that they act out. So it's, it's really, really hard on the caregiver. And Mary, I'm, I'm so sorry about the loss of your husband, but that's another really tough dementia. Mary, let me, let me run this by you. I don't want to make you uncomfortable or anything, but I'm trying to learn about this too. And hopefully your experience and some of the other experiences from some of our callers may be beneficial. But let me ask you this, after diagnosis, Mary, if it's not too painful to talk about it, how long did your husband live, and how difficult okay. is it to okay. take care of somebody like that? Okay. Uh, I'm from Franklin Parish. I'm a retired teacher. He's a retired uh, high school principal. Yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, it just took his very personality away from me. And... Toward the end, he became combative, and then he became violent. And uh, uh, from what I hear, those persons with Lewy body dementia, uh, once they're diagnosed, do not live as long as uh, some people who may have different kinds of dementia. I know. From August until he passed away, uh, January the 21st of, 25th of this year, um, he, he, we could really tell a big difference. And, and it quickly progressed. 
and we finally had to uh, twice have him hospitalized in uh, Dr. Brian Hope's clinic in Western Road. Yes, ma'am. And uh, because he was actually scaring the patients in the nursing home. And uh, so we had to, uh, Dr. Weinhold, I love him forever because he was so, he was such a good diagnostician and just a good physician uh, 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 concerning this care. Mary, but, uh, Ma Mary uh, clarif clarify this, this for me, which I didn't really sure, understand. Sure. From diagnosis until his death, how long was that time frame? Okay, uh, about two years before, I started seeing uh, minute changes in his personality. Yeah. My children thought I was just imagining things. But of course, I was with him all the time. They were most of them out of sight. But uh, I began to see changes and then uh, he recognized it, and he gave up his uh, his official post in some organizations because he saw that he was beginning to not be able to write. Jennifer, that's that's a pretty rapid onslaught, isn't it? Isn't that a pretty it, it rapid? Really, that... really, really was. But from this past August until January. It was very rapid. Mary, and, uh, Mary, listen, and, we need to get another caller. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. Uh, God bless well, you. I know it was well, a tough thing to go through. Lanny, we have admired you through the years. Thank and you, ma'am. my hat's off to you because you're a class act person. Oh, you are too. Thanks so much for saying that. Okay, and thank you, Miss Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Okay, folks, we're talking about Alzheimer's and dementia. What a nice thing to say. You know, I'm an old transplanted Yankee, Jennifer. By, by, by the way, my oldest daughter's named Jennifer. Oh, okay. But I love the South. These are the nicest people. I never laid eyes on this lady. I did TV, I did TV sports down here for 20 years, and I love talk radio because we talk about so many things. Mary, this has hurt so many people. I got another call, and we'll get to him in just a second. Before we do, I want to ask you this, and I'm sure that there's, boy, there's more than one answer to this, but what's the hardest part about caring for somebody that you truly, truly love and maybe have even worshipped for years and watching them just just go down so much over time? What, what's the hardest thing about it? I believe that the hardest part of it is watching the person become so different. Most people who have a dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or any other type of dementia, they become often so unrecognizable to their loved one. Most family members can wrap their head around the fact that, okay, the short-term memory is gone. But like Mary was talking about, her husband became some combative. It sounded like it was uncharacteristic for him not knowing who your grandkids are. It, it, for a lot of people, it's like they're losing their loved one little bit by little bit by little bit. And that stress is so overwhelming. That's right. It's so cruel, isn't it? It's so cruel. Jennifer, let me ask you this. And I, I don't know. To me, it would take such a special person to be able to care for somebody mm -hmm. like that. There's, I'm sure there's no black and white line here, but at what point does the family have to quit trying to care for these people at home? And I want to hear from some of you people out there. I know it's painful to talk about. You don't have to give your name if you don't want to, but if you're dealing with this, give me a call. But is there, I don't know, yeah. when, is, when is that point, what is that point, yeah. Jennifer, when it usually arrives? Yeah, that, cruising through caregiving, my book, that's one of the things we talk about is that a lot of people look at, uh, I need to place my loved one somewhere else. I can't do it anymore. They sometimes look at that as a failure. It's not. Most people with an irreversible dementia, like Alzheimer's, like Lewy body, 
they are going to become physically dependent on you. And think about it. Somebody like Mary, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, if her husband's a bigger guy than she is, she's going to have a hard time getting him to the bathroom. Somebody with an irreversible dementia starts to not be able to take care of their personal care needs, getting to the bathroom, dressing. Another big sign that you really need to consider moving your loved one is when they're walking out of the house. Uh, people wander right out of the house. And a lot of times when you see a silver alert, uh, that means that someone with dementia has wandered away from their home. So when the person becomes really physically dependent, wandering, another example is I worked with a client once who started cooking what she thought was dinner time. It's the middle of the morning, and then she goes to bed. She's got a whole dinner on the stove and big fire hazard. So those are some things that should really get families thinking, maybe I can't do this at home anymore. Maybe I need help outside the home. Well, you, when you mentioned they, they had a sense of failure, I guess, I guess that, that there's some guilt involved, even though the caretaker may be doing the very best they can. That would, I would think that that would rise, you know, raise its ugly head over time, wouldn't you, with a lot of people? Guilt yes. is, is such a strong, major problem for caregivers because mm. it doesn't matter how, how much they do, how hard they're working. It, for many caregivers, it never feels like enough. And they, it, the whole goal is if you're caring for somebody with dementia, you have to have a group of people doing it, friends, family, neighbors, people from church or, or Rotary Club or whatever people that you hire, it never is a job for just one or two people. And that's probably the most important thing I hope your listeners take away from this. No one person should be doing the caregiving for someone with dementia by themselves. Jennifer, I know you know a lot about it. You probably dealt with a lot of people that you've helped. But let me ask you about you, yourself, your family. Sure. Have you had to deal this deal with this on a personal level at all? You know what? I have been so fortunate. I've been a caregiver for my grandmother, my grandfather, and my grandmother-in-law, and they all had different illnesses, and, but, but I don't have dementia. I have never been a caregiver personally. I've been professionally, of course, but not personally. Are you seeing any breakthroughs? Are, are there any kinds of medication that can stop the progression of maybe a uh, Alzheimer's or this horrible brand of dementia, which I'd never even heard of until Mary mentioned it. Uh, are they making progress, and do you see light at the end of the tunnel? I know it's something they'll never cure, but are they making progress to, to slow it down and make, make life more livable, maybe for more years? Lanny, I, first of all, I'm an optimist, and I hope that someday we do have a cure, but right now the best researchers are telling us that there's nothing on the imminent horizon. So the best thing that we can do, I'll tell you, there's no pill, there's nothing we can do to prevent right now, but the only thing we can try to do is try to avoid having, you know, if you have heart disease, take care of it, you know, because that's a big risk factor for Alzheimer's or it's highly associated. And I know this is gonna sound a little bit silly, but try not to get a head injury because it's so highly associated. I know no one's out looking for a head injury, right. of course, but wear your seatbelt. If you're on a bicycle or a motorcycle, wear a helmet. That, you know, you want to try to protect your head. But, but really, those are, living as healthfully as possible in terms of trying to uh, decrease the odds of having heart disease, or if you have it, take care of yourself. Do what your doctor's telling you in terms of lifestyle changes or taking medicine for heart disease. Well, I know playing high school football, Jennifer, I had at least two concussions. Hopefully, no bad ramifications. Listen, you've been great. I want to keep you on a few more minutes. Sure. Can you hang with me? I got a of call, course. and then I'm going to bring up something that you or may or may not want to, you may not agree with me on, but I, I always say what I feel on this show. I know how tough this disease is. We'll take a break. We got Carl waiting on another line. Carl, hang with us after the break. We'll be back with more with Jennifer Fitzpatrick. Welcome back, everybody. Our guest is uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, and she knows an awful lot about dementia and Alzheimer's. A touchy, touchy subject that touches a lot of people. Carl, on line three. 
Well, thank you so much, Lanny. I appreciate you taking my call. And uh, Jennifer, my dad, is uh, has had some mild dementia um, in the past couple of years, mainly affecting his speech. But we are uh, constantly going over the medications he's taking and, and interactions of those medications. And, you know, a, a recent study just shows that warfarin, you know, might help uh, aid, you know, um, dementia in some ways. It's just a study. I don't know that it's definitive. But uh, we're, we're constantly worried about medication. And I mean, my question really is, do you think that the uh, major amounts of medication that older Americans are taking these days is uh, indicative of causative? Does it have a, you know, in your opinion, is it making us worse? Is it, are medicines making the dementia worse? Yeah, in general terms, right. I, in other words, you know, our uh, older Americans are taking so much medicine these sure. days. Okay. You know, uh, and, and a lot of these things these days, you know, the FDA rushes these compounds through for and gets them on the store shelves pretty quickly, you know. So uh, we're constantly worried about what, um, you know, if the, the medications that he's taking may be aiding uh, the oh, okay. onset of dementia to some degree. I so, was curious as to what your opinion is. So first, I just just to clarify, I'm not a physician. I'm a gerontologist. But my, my thought on that is that most older Americans are on, I think the average, you know, don't, I think it's approximately people over 65, 70, or on approximately seven, six or seven. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact number. But so, and, and people in nursing homes and assisted livings, I think it's up to approximately 11, something like that. It's so a lot. Right? Most older adults are taking quite a few meds. So, but, but you got to remember, not all older adults have dementia. Lots and lots don't. So right. my recommendation is you always, I, I say do a cost-benefit analysis with your physician. Sit down with your doc and say, or, or your dad, you know, sit down with your dad and say, and your and your dad's doc, your dad's your dad's physician, and say, okay, what what medicines are necessary? Are, are there any that we could cut out? And really, because some medicines really are necessary for his quality of life, or maybe that even are are helping to to minimize a condition that he has. But it is true there are some meds, if, especially if the dosage is too high, that it's possible that there could be. It, it can sometimes impact memory, but I would always talk to a physician or a pharmacist about that. And remember, you always, with any med, you want to do a cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth taking this? What are the risks? That, that's what I would recommend about it. But I, I, don't, I don't think that it's because of medicine that anyone is having Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. I mean, Alzheimer's disease was discovered in, in 1906, believe it or not. So it's been around for a really long time. Carl, thanks for calling. Thank you. All right, you got another call coming in. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at you, Jennifer, and I yeah. always try to be honest about what I what I feel about things. And I've discussed this before, and I may have done a show like this maybe 20 years ago. As I mentioned, I'm 76. Everything seems to be going pretty good. The thought of Alzheimer's to me is very upsetting. And let me say this, and I. Some of you folks may think I'm out of line here, but I'm not suggesting what anybody do does. I'm just telling you how I feel. Jennifer, if I got it, I would like to get some kind of a living will in, in, in advance, tell my doctor that if I get to a point where I can't correspond with anybody anymore, I can't talk, I want to peacefully be put to sleep. The thought of my kids or my friends yeah. coming to see me for 10 years, right. I, I, it's, it's just so upsetting to me. I don't know if I'm a nut for saying this. Some of you people out there may believe, and I'm not telling anybody what to do with their parent or anything. And let me say this, Jennifer, if you got five kids and you're getting you know, towards the end and you may live another five years with Alzheimer's, you know how some of these families are. One of these kids may want you to go right away so he can get the money. You know what I'm talking about. This should be a choice only made by the person in advance that's going through it. 
am I being a nut here? Have you have have you heard other people oh, feel this way? I just I just don't want to. It's not so much I don't want to go through it because after a while I probably won't know. But it just breaks my heart to think of my kids coming to see me every day and I can't talk to them. Uh, your thoughts? Many people say that when they when we talk about Alzheimer's and other dementias. Many people have those thoughts and feelings. You know, as a professional in the field, as a licensed professional, I mean. I, I have to follow the law, and, and docs have to follow the law. And, you know, even, you got to remember, even in the states where physician-assisted suicide is legal, um, it's very strict parameters. And so what I would say, Lanny, is if that's something that's important to you, that, that you want to fight for that legislatively. If you, if you think that that right is important, because even in the states where physician-assisted suicide is legal, which is very few, uh, there are very specific parameters. Um, and, and, you know, I believe that most of them, it has to be that your prognosis is six months or less. So, I, yeah, I you know, you wouldn't really even... But I told you about the guy that lived 10 years. And, Jennifer, let me say this. I met, I, I ran into some lawyers today up in uh, Farmerville, Louisiana, where I live. And we talked about this, and they said, Lanny, that's not legal in right. this state. But let me, I want to, before you and I talk any more, Jennifer... I want to look at this from a from a religious standpoint. Now, I'm a Christian, and some people have said that you should leave it in God's hands, but I don't know if God wants for you to suffer till the last minute. I don't know. I'm going to bring on a preacher named Kurt, Kurt Auger from First Baptist of Farmerville. Kurt, Lanny James, how you doing? I'm good, Lanny. How are you? Good. You've been hearing this conversation. Now, you and I ran into each other a few weeks ago, and we discussed this, so I kind of know how you feel. Yes, sir. But from a biblical standpoint or religious standpoint um, what am I is this just a wrong thing for me to even think about what what do you say from the from a religious side well let, let me answer from two perspectives one from somebody's personally connected um, both of my grandparents both of my grandmothers maternal and paternal both died with dementia and Alzheimer's one of them severely went back into the fetal position before oh. she died so I know it firsthand. Um, so I'm speaking from a family member that's went through it, which you you tell me that you never have, but I can tell you from a personal experience some of the struggles there. And also from someone who is a person of faith. Uh, of course, you know, I, I hear you saying I, my feelings are or my thoughts are. And I think, Lenny, that's one of the problems that we struggle with in our society today is that our personal feelings and our human thoughts can never supersede absolute truth, which is God's Word. Now, as a minister, of course, and a Christian, I believe in absolute truth. And so, for me, I have to re rule out all of my reasonings and my feelings because there are things in my fallen human-natured body that lead me to feel and think things that don't always line up with absolute truth. And so I go to the scriptures, and I, I know we don't have time for a big sermon, but, you know, the Bible teaches that God is the authority over life and death. He created life. He gives life. He sustains life. He, um, um, he protects our lives. He calls it to an end. And we could go through, if we had time, and look at scriptures that teach that. I know you've heard that before. The Bible also teaches that murder is wrong, and murder in context of scripture is any uh, premeditated, thought through, uh, intentional causing of death that is not um, categorized in some exclusion in Scripture. Um, there's always exclusions, time of war, protection of your own personal body or family. Um, of course, I would say capital punishment. Kurt, let me interrupt here real quick, and I've only got a couple of minutes. Jennifer, I guess the way I see this in my mind, when your body dies, you're dead. But what about when your mind dies? Isn't that the same, or is it not? Well, you know, I definitely see your perspective for sure, um, and I certainly agree with our caller in terms of, you know, respecting his perspective as well, but I, you know, you've got to know that in terms of people who have dementia, they're still in there. You see it with music. When somebody has advanced dementia, they might not be able to talk anymore, but 
so I've seen it so many times that, you know, especially like our callers talking about if they're a religious person, if you put on religious music, that they their facial expression changes. That if you rub their, if you give them a massage on their on their back, that they'll respond. Maybe they can't talk to you. Maybe they can't. They don't even remember your name, but they're still in there. And so I hear what you're saying about the brain's gone and the person surely is different, but I believe that they're still in there. Jennifer, you've been great. I. I just, I tried to bring this in a lot of directions. I know how difficult it is, and Kurt, I appreciate you sharing that because you you know firsthand what it was like. Thanks to both of you folks for being on, and maybe maybe we'll follow up with another show down the road. Jennifer, thanks so I much. I'd love to come back if you have if you have the, the opportunity, if you have a need. So thank you so much. Thank you, and you too, Kurt. Well, thanks so much. I would so love much. to come back as well. We didn't get to really share some things, and you know, quality of life, lady, is one of the things that y'all did not talk about. Yep, look, we're out of time. Okay, buddy. Thank